Mahabharata at its core is a narrative of a fratricidal battle between the cousins, the Kauravas and the Pandavas for kingship. In this great war, though the Pandavas finally win, the victory comes at a great cost as millions of lives were lost. The epic says it was written by Veda Vyasa at the request of the creator of all the worlds, Brahma. Brahma, who could see the values and ethics in the world crumbling, had asked Sage Vyasa, who had compiled the four Vedas, to distill the essence and present it as a narrative accessible to all. People, he said, either did not now have the time or the erudition to understand the Vedas and it was necessary to share this knowledge in a form accessible to all. As Vyasa understood the Vedas, he would be the correct person to transmit its knowledge in a simpler form. That is why the Mahabharata is called the fifth Veda in these traditions. Vyasa acceded to Brahma's request and said that as the task he was assigned was monumental, he would need a scribe to write it as he was narrating. Brahma suggested that Ganapati, the elephant-headed deity, would be the perfect scribe for Vyasa. Ganapati accepted to be Vyasa's scribe if Vyasa could narrate as fast as he himself could write. Vyasa accepted this, but he also said that Ganapati should first understand what was being said before writing it down. The Mahabharata is composed by Vyasa as 18 books of Parvas and starts well before the Great War. According to medieval Indian aestheticians like Anandavardhana and Abhinav Gupta, the Mahabharata was an implicitly anti-war text. Abhinav Gupta in his Lochana, his commentary on Anandavardhana's Dvanya Loka, says this about the aesthetic experience. In the course of this beginningless journey through this universe, we have experienced all emotions. Thus, nobody fully aware of his own humanity can fail to be moved by another person's experiences. The Mahabharata begins by describing itself. The epic speaks on Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha and on these it says, what is found everywhere will be found here and what is not found here can be found nowhere. First question the epic poses is as to what caused the disastrous war to be fought and enumerates a list of probable causes which could have led to the Great War. It gives up this speculation as being futile as the Great War had already taken place and millions of lives had been lost. The next significant detail the epic speaks about itself is that it was a narrative which had been retold many times before. Numerous sages had heard the epic either from Vyasa himself or from his disciple Sauti and the epic in a much larger form had already been heard in the seven heavens. The first time the epic was narrated on earth, it says, was at the snake yagna of King Janamejaya, the great grandson of the Pandavas. King Parikshit, due to a thoughtless action of his, was cursed to die of snake bite and he was unable to avert his own death even after taking the most stringent of precautions. Janamejaya, to avenge his father's murder, decided to perform the snake yakna, the purpose of which was to rid the world of snakes. His yagna was doomed to failure as snakes in Indian traditions represents the fruits of one's actions or its karma. What in effect Janamejaya wanted to do was to free action so that no action will have any repercussions. This is obviously undesirable as it would lead to an amoral, immoral universe where anybody could do anything with impunity. So Janamejaya was asked to listen to the epic to learn about the ways of karma and to ruminate on what it meant to lead an ethical life. All these details are narrated in the first terse 50 verses of the epic. The first voice of a person who is directly involved with the war and who speaks in the epic is the blind king Dhritarashtra. Dhritarashtra was the father of the Kauravas whose antagonism with their cousins the Pandavas led to the great war. 
it is significant that in a narrative of war the first voice that is heard is the voice of the vanquished here dhritarashtra addresses sanjaya his charioteer and the recounter who narrated the events of the 18 days of battle as they were happening to the blind king when dhritarashtra speaks the war is over and all his sons have been killed with enormous destruction of both sides of the opposing army dhritarashtra says listen to me o sanjaya listen to all i am now about to say you will then find that it's not worth to treat me with contempt you are learned in the shastras you are intelligent and possess of wisdom my inclinations were never for war nor did i feel pleasure in the destruction of my race i felt no difference between my sons and the sons of pandu my own sons were wayward and they hated me because i was old and blind i bore all on account of my miserable state and for paternal affection i was foolish and thoughtless and duryodhana grew in folly what is the correct or ethical action is a principal question of the epic the epic at one level is a compendium of multiple stories of people addressing the various ethical dilemmas in their own life all framed against the narrative of the great war the epic travels back and forth in time narrating many mirror stories which add nuances to the ethical dilemmas of the protagonists of the great war one narrative strand with the epic weaves is the genealogy of the ancestors of the warring cousins starting from their first born ancestor puru the narrative of the great war actually begins with king shantanu the great 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 grand descendant of the king puru shantanu had uh, three sons devarata from his first wife ganga and chitrangada and vichitravirya from his second wife satyavati satyavati had wanted her children to rule the kingdom as a precondition for her marriage to king shantanu king shantanu's first born son devarata had hence renounced his right to rule and had also taken a vow of celibacy so that he would have no children to contest the kingdom with his half brothers this is why he was henceforth known as bhishma or the one who had taken a terrible vow in indian traditions to die without leaving a progeny behind is a worse curse to a human being and bhishma voluntarily taking this upon himself is one framing narrative to approach the epic on king shantanu's demise vichitra virya became the king under the guardianship of his elder brother bhishma his elder brother and rightful heir chitrangada had been killed by a gandharva of the same name leaving vichitra virya as the sole claimant for the throne vichitra virya married two sisters ambika and nambalika but died too early leaving no heirs behind the first narrator and composer of the epic veda vyasa enters his own narrative at this point vyasa who was the first born son of queen satyavati and the sage parashara and is requested by his mother to ensure that the puru dynasty does not end with the death of her son vichitra virya the storyteller vyasa fathers three children with ambika ambalika and their maid these are the grandchildren of satyavati and heir to the kingdom dhritarashtra pandu and vidura as dhritarashtra was born blind his younger brother pandu is crowned the king the third half brother vidura had no claims to the throne as he was the son of the maid of the two queens ambika and ambalika this inscription of the author into his own text is a distinctive feature of epic traditions and vyasa is both the author and the progenitor of the principal characters of the great war valmiki also inscribes himself into the ramayana as a witness who watches the epic unfold from within the sanctuary of his own hermitage vyasa the author of the mahabharata keeps intriguingly entering his own narrative at crucial junctures while valmiki's hermitage becomes a sanctuary for rama's sons lava and kusha and valmiki himself becomes a final facilitator in reuniting rama with his two sons this inscription of the author into the text immediately makes it self reflexive and this self reflexive quality 
is meticulously maintained in all narrative and performance traditions of the epic. As A.K. Ramarajam aptly puts it, as a listener, you are simultaneously both within the epic and outside it by a curious process which this project will explore. Listening to the epics is simultaneously also a listening to of one's own story. The other element which unites epic traditions is that all popular epics are finally stories of Vanavasam and Titan. As one storyteller whom I recorded said simply that to be a good king or even a good human being, periodically one has to leave one's zones of comfort and live in the forest. Here one has to kill the demons both within and outside of oneself. Only then, he said, a return was possible. The story of the Great War, the Mahabharata, as enacted in performance editions in India, really starts with the conflict between the great-grandchildren of Satyavati, the sons of Dhrashra and Pandu, for kingship. Dhrashra had a hundred sons, with the eldest of them, Duryodhana, staking his claim for kingship. Pandu, due to a curse, had abdicated the kingdom to live a life of an ascetic in the forest. And his five sons, the Pandavas, were born in Vanavasam, in the forest. Yudhishthira, being the eldest born of all the cousins, was considered the rightful claimant to the throne. And the seeds for the conflict are now out in the open. Unknown to the Pandavas, they were elder brother Karna, who is actually the rightful heir to the throne, being the eldest son of their mother, Kunti. Karna, by a curious turn of events, becomes one of the closest friends of Duryodhana and also one of his main warriors in the Great War, fighting against his own younger brothers. On their father Pandu's death, in his self-imposed life in the forest, the Pandavas make their first visit to Hastinapura. Here they live with their cousins, the Kauravas, under the guardianship of their grandfather, Bhishma. When the Kauravas and the Pandavas come of age, Dhritarashtra first crowns Yudhishthira as the crown prince, which does not please his son, Duryodhana. Duryodhana, having no intention of serving under his elder brother, Yudhishthira, has deceitfully built a palace of combustible materials and requests them to stay there till the kingdom could be properly divided. Duryodhana actually intends to burn the palace with his cousins inside while they are sleeping. Bhima, the strongest of the Pandavas, comes to hear of this plot and escapes the burning palace, carrying his mother and brothers on his shoulders. This begins the second Vanavasam, or period of living in the forest, for the Pandavas. The Pandavas are now forced to live incognito, still under threat of death from their cousin Duryodhana. Their fortune changes when Arjuna, in the disguise of a pure Brahmin, wins the hand of Draupadi, the princess of Panchala, in marriage. With this alliance, the Pandavas find their first strongest ally, Indrupada, the king of Panchala. With the support of the Panchala kingdom and of Krishna, other kings also pledge their support to Yudhishthira and the prospect of a fratricidal war among the cousins becomes a distinct possibility. Duryodhana, to avert an inevitable war, is forced to concede land to the Pandavas. Reluctantly, Duryodhana gives them an inhospitable tract of forest land as their share of the kingdom. The Pandavas turn this inhospitable land into a fertile kingdom and establish their capital in the Prastha. The deity of fire, Agni, now enters the narrative and requests the help of Arjuna and Krishna in burning the Kandava forest, which is part of their kingdom. In the epic, this is another crucial episode, the repercussions of which will threaten the future of the Pandava progeny themselves. The forest is 
ruled by a king of snakes, Takshaka, who fights Arjuna and Krishna when they try to burn the forest in order to protect his own family and kingdom. Takshaka escapes the forest fire but loses the entire family and makes a vow of killing the Pandava progeny in retaliation. This he fulfills when he kills King Parikshit, the grandson of the Pandavas, accentuating the inherent self-reflexivity of the epic. The killing of King Parikshit is the primary cause for the epic to be first narrated on earth to Janamejaya, the son of King Parikshit. Yudhishthira, on establishing his kingdom at Indrapatha, has now become a powerful monarch with all the kings of the land declaring their allegiance to him. Krishna advises him to consolidate his power by performing the Rajasuvi Yagna, in effect declaring himself the Chakravarti or the emperor of all the lands under his domain. Yudhishthira's palace is built by a Gandharva architect, Mayan, and the palace of illusions that he has built becomes the next narrative element, impelling the epic towards a great war. All the kings of the land are invited to the ceremony, and the Kauravas are given pride of place, as finally speaking, they were a part of the family. Yudhishthira, as a courteous person, offers to show around the palace to his younger brother Duryodhana, but he refuses this offer preferring to explore the palace of illusion on his own. Duryodhana has to confront his own jealousy and anger at the prosperity of his cousins in his walk through the magical palace. The palace in its own way undermines Duryodhana's pride at his own might. A befuddled Duryodhana stumbles and falls in his walk through the labyrinthine palace. His sense of humiliation is compounded as he sees that Draupadi the wife of the Pandavas has witnessed his fall. His anger is further intensified when he hears Draupadi laughing merrily at his discomfiture. To humiliate the Pandavas and Draupadi as he felt himself humiliated becomes a primary desire of Duryodhana from this point of the narrative onwards. Duryodhana confers with his principal advisor, his maternal uncle Shakuni, to plot the Pandavas' downfall. Shakuni has magical dice, and with this dice, he is invincible in gambling as the dice would fall on whichever number he desired. Shakuni and Duryodhana decide that to humiliate the Pandavas, they first have to be stripped of all the wealth that they had acquired. War against the Pandavas at this point of time was not an option as they were far stronger than their cousins, the Kauravas. Deceit, it is decided, is the only way that their ambition could be achieved. Shakuni points out the only weakness in Yudhishthira, which was his love for gambling. The plotters build a palace for Duryodhana and invite their cousins, as a reciprocal gesture, to stay at this palace. Yudhishthira, against the advice of Draupadi and his brothers, accepts this invitation. He first gambles and loses his kingdom. Then he loses his brothers, himself, and finally, when he has nothing left to wager, he pledges and loses their wife Draupadi to the invincible gambler Shakuni. Duryodhana now decides to gloat over his victory by demanding Draupadi to be present in the royal assembly as a slave to the Kaurava wives. Draupadi refuses to come, quoting a legal objection to this request. She says that Isistra's pledging of her as a wager was illegal as by then he had lost himself in the game of dice. Her question being as to how a person who had lost himself could pledge another person. A furious Duryodhana sends his brother Duchasana to forcibly drag Draupadi to the court. To further humiliate her, he asks Duchasana to publicly disrobe her in the open court. The attempt of Duchasana to disrobe Draupadi is foiled by the magical intervention of her brother Krishna and Draupadi pledges that she will not be satisfied until the entire Kaurava clan is decimated. The elders of the warring cousins intervene at this point 
in an attempt to resolve the conflict. Initially, Dhritarashtra gives back the kingdom and the lands of the Pandavas at loss back to them. And as the Pandavas are about to depart from Hastinapura, Duryodhana gets scared. He convinces his father to call back the Pandavas and one more game of dice is played. The wager being that whoever loses in this final 13th game of dice has to live in exile or in the forest for 12 years and one year in hiding. Yudhishthira loses this 13th game of dice also and the Pandavas leave for their third and final Vanavasam where they have to live 12 years in open exile in the forest and one year incognito. If the whereabouts are discovered in this one year of hiding, then the Pandavas have to live in the forest for another 13 years. Once the Pandavas have successfully completed the 13 years of Panavasam, the elders say Duryodhana would return back the kingdom of Yudhishthira. The Pandavas could have easily routed their cousins in battle and reclaimed their kingdom. But Yudhishthira is bound by his code of ethics and chooses to accept the verdict of the elders. The cousins, both the Kauravas and the Pandavas, accept this compromise and the Pandavas depart for their life in the forest. This period of Panavasam is where the Pandavas listen to the stories of the ancestors and also to mirror stories of other kings who faced similar predicaments in their own life. The stories which are narrated at this juncture are in a sense the crux of the epic and encapsulate notion of what being in the world in the cultural context of the milieu means. The Pandavas with Draupadi successfully complete the Vanavasam but Duryodhana reneges on his word and refuses to return their kingdom. The inevitable war is fought and people from both armies lose their lives. The Pandavas discover too late that Karna was the eldest brother and he too dies a meaningless death. After the tragedy of Karna's death, and the death of Salya and Shakuni, Duryodhana has left the last Kaurava warrior standing. Finally, even he is killed by his arch enemy Bhima and Yudhishthira is said to be crowned king. A grief-stricken Yudhishthira is reluctant to be crowned king at the expense of so many lives and so much human suffering. Krishna takes him to the dying Bhishma, resting on his bed of arrows, and requests him to expound on Dharma to Yudhishthira. Yudhishthira is convinced by Bhishma's discourse on Dharma and consents to be crowned the king. In performance traditions, four discourses on Dharma, the first by Aneksha, who is actually Yama, the god of Dharma and death, the second Viduranidhi or Vidura's discourse on Dharma, Gita Upadesham or Krishna's discourse on Dharma to Arjuna, and finally Bhishma Upadesham or Bhishma's discourse on Dharma to Yudhishthira are said to be the four pillars on which the epic rests. To truly understand the import of the text, it is said that one has to read these four discourses very carefully. The epic continues out of the coronation and Yudhishthira performs Ashwamedha Yagna, which formally makes him the emperor of all the 56 kingdoms of the world. Now Dvapara Yuga has entered and is now the age of Kali Yuga or the age of Adharma. Yudhishthira crowns Arjuna's grandson Parikshit as a king and the Pandavas with Draupadi choose to begin their final journey. Krishna also departs to his abode in Vaikuntha, felled by the arrow of an hunter. The epic narrates the final demise and the fate of each of the surviving warriors. Performance traditions of the epic generally conclude with the coronation of Yudhishthira and the narrative of what happened later is really the concern of another journey. <laughs>